Hi, I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for week number 19 of season two of Live with Annie. It is always fun to see our regular viewers here and to welcome new viewers too. So thank you for making time to be with us today. Please remember to leave a comment. Um, if you have any questions, leave a comment to let us know you're here, where you're joining us from, and don't forget to follow us wherever you're watching so that you're sure to know about new episodes. If you've got any questions as we go, be sure to leave those in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. And if you know somebody who you think would enjoy these um, episodes, please be sure to tag them. And if tagging is new to you, all you have to do is hit the at symbol, type in the name that they use on the platform where you're tagging them, and their picture and name will pop up so you can make sure you've got the right person. Click on that, send your um, comment to them, and then they can watch along with you. So last week, we walked through the steps to assemble a bag, and we focused on our ultimate travel bag. So we showed how to join the zipper strips to the side strip to make the loop that forms the top, bottom, and sides of the bag, and then we showed how to prepare the bag front and back and join those to finish the bag. If you missed it or if you want to watch it again, remember that you can find all the previous episodes of Live with Annie on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or at byannie.com live. And we'll put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. So today we are going to talk about bindings. And I know a lot of people cringe at that word. So today my goal is to take away some of the angst and help you enjoy or at least appreciate bindings. Bindings really help give a beautiful professional finish and they also add structure and style to your projects. They are so worth the effort. So we are going to start by discussing styles and types of bindings and how to easily make bindings to perfectly match your project and in the right size to give the best results. You are going to learn a lot of tips for achieving smooth, wrinkle-free bindings on your project, so let's get going. So one of the hallmarks of a Biani bag is that there are no raw edges anywhere, even on the inside. So I want it to show this little out and about bag. As you can see, by binding the seams, any of the seams that would be exposed, we give a really professional finish to the backpack. Bindings also eliminate the need for loose floppy linings. Because my main and lining fabric are quilted together, all the layers are secure and I don't have loose linings in here. That is probably the thing I appreciate the most about bindings and one of the reasons why we use so many bindings in our projects. Bindings also add style and a professional finish to your projects. So let me find this little bag that I wanted to show you. So by making your own custom bindings, you can use fabrics that match your project or add a fun pop of color as we did on this one. The striped binding that we used on this Take a Stand bag really livens it up and makes it extra special. We also love the structure that bindings give a project. And this is our little in control caddy. So the binding that we've used around the edges of this in control caddy really help it stand up and be sturdy. I've been asked more than once, what type of cording did you use on that edge? None. This is simply a double fold binding covering two layers of quilted fabric. But the soft and stable in the seams gives the appearance and structure of a corded binding without any extra steps. So here's an important tip about bindings. If you bind the outside of a project, and let me grab a couple of examples here. If you bind the outside of a project, you're going to get a more structured, tailored appearance. If you bind the inside of a project, you've got softened edges and it gives a more rounded appearance. So as you can see, both of these bags are made with a front and a back and a zipper side strip that goes around those pieces. On this one, we joined them with the right sides together when we sewed it so that the binding in it ended up on the inside. That gave it a kind of soft, more rounded appearance. 
On this one, we joined it with the lining sides together so that the binding is attached on the outside, which gives it a more tailored finished appearance. So when we design a pattern, we decide which method we like best or which method we think will give the best results for the majority of our customers, and then we write the pattern using that method. But that said, in most cases, if you prefer to attach the binding to the other side, go for it. It really is as easy as joining the pieces with the other sides together and attaching the binding. Get those off the table and we're going to talk next about styles and types of fabric bindings and why we prefer to make our own custom bindings. So let me grab just a few little bits of stuff here. I think we'll grab all of those. So our patterns use two different styles of fabric bindings, either single fold or double fold. And on a single fold binding, you have Actually, where is my sample of that? Oh, right here. On a single fold binding, you have just one layer of fabric covering the raw edges. I will say that we rarely use this method in our patterns, and we really only use it for edges that aren't going to get a lot of wear and tear, because we like having more layers there, or areas where we want to reduce bulk. And that's what we did on this bag right here. This is our Bon Voyage tote. And when we join it on the inside, we, we sew our seams, we press our seams open, and we want it to have as little bulk there as possible. So on this particular pattern, we bound each of the edges with a single fold binding. And basically, a single fold binding is one layer of fabric, and you sew it to your side, you have to turn under the edge on the other side so that when you fold this around and stitch down, you have a finished edge. So that's how we do single fold bindings in our patterns. But the vast majority of our patterns use double fold bindings. And for those, the fabric is folded in half twice. That's going to ensure that all of the raw edges are hidden and only folded edges are exposed. So it's really quick and easy to apply. And it also prolongs wear because you've got a double layer of fabric on all the edges. And we're going to cover the steps for doing that soon. But one question I'm often asked is, can't I just buy ready-made bias binding for my project? I really strongly discourage that. And here are some of the reasons why. So here is a package of double fold binding that I had in in my stash. And if you look at this, the first thing you're going to see is that the quality is not at all the same. It's a, it's not the same type of fa fabric. Um, it's just not going to look the same. It's not likely that I'm going to be able to find a purchased bias binding that's going to match my project. So if I want a multi-dimensional stripe like this um, to do my binding, the chances of finding that in a ready-made binding are slim. Also, the sizes are very different. So this is called a double fold binding. But if you look at the size of this that it starts compared to the size that we normally cut a binding, you can see it's going to be a whole lot different. So it's not going to be the same width. It's going to be much harder to use. And it's so easy to make bias binding um, that I can't see any reason why you'd want to buy it ready made. So one advantage of making your own binding is that you can use fabric that perfectly coordinates with your project. You can also cut it to the perfect width. Because if binding is too narrow, it's going to be really difficult to cover the seam. And I did a few examples here. So here I've taken two pieces of quilted fabric. I've sewn those together. And I cut a binding that's really too narrow for this piece. So you can see that I've sewn it on with the quarter inch seam. And now it's time to fold it over. And I don't even have enough here to cover my raw edges, much less cover that line of stitching. So having the binding cut to the right width is really important there. If my binding is too wide, so let's say I want to bind a pocket, and I've cut this binding wider than what the pattern would recommend, then when I bring it over and I want to get it so that it's even with my quilted edge here, then when I stitch along the edge here, as you can see, now I've got a line of stitching going through my pocket on the back. 
So again, using a binding too wide caused problems there. The other way you could do that if the binding is too wide and you want to get it lined up so it just covers your seam so that your line of stitching falls out in the same place on each side, then what happens is you've got excess loose fabric up here and then you're going to have a wrinkly appearance on the top. So using the proper width makes such a difference and that's one of the advantages of making it yourself. So let's talk about a few of the widths that we use in our projects. So this is our little back at you um, backpack and on here we have found that if we're only binding a single layer of vinyl mesh or quilted fabric as we did on here on this flap, two inches is the perfect width. So by sewing a two inch width on here when I when I sew it along the edge, I'm, my line of stitching is falling out in exactly the same place on the other side. It's not showing here on the lining and it's looking perfect on this side and I'm not having wrinkly edges out here. We did the same thing on our little glow and go um, wrap that is perfect for makeup brushes and stuff. On here we bound the edge of a piece of vinyl. That would be really, really obvious if we didn't have the right width because you'd see it from the other side. So if we had used a wider binding, we'd have had problems. So pay attention, follow the pattern, do the size that it needs. Two inches is perfect for single layers. Two and a quarter inches is our choice if we're doing multiple layers, like we did on this catch-all caddy. So we've got several layers that we're going through. Two and a quarter is enough to cover it well and not be wrinkly on the edges. Very, very occasionally, we will suggest a two and a half inch binding, and that is what we call for on this travel duffel bag. So this bag happens to be bound on the inside edges, so we did two inches on all the pockets, but when we bound these edges, we did a two and a half inch binding. But here's something really important to know. A tighter binding is going to give you a better binding. It is so much easier to get a smooth wrinkle-free binding if it's completely filled. So I'm okay using two and a half inches on this bag as it makes it easier to put together. We've got a lot of layers that we're joining here at the bottom and because the binding is hidden on the inside. But if you look at this binding, and I'm going to turn it part way out. Maybe I'll just turn the whole thing inside out so you can see it. All right, so if you look at the edges of this binding, especially up at the top here, where there aren't several layers, can you see those wrinkles that are there? That again is because I'm using the wider binding. So in order to keep my stitching where it needs to be, my binding extends a little beyond that edge and I've got some wrinkles in there. I'm okay with that because it's on the inside and it made it easier here, but it's why we normally prefer to use the two and a quarter inch binding. Had I made this bag with the binding on the outside, I definitely would have used a two and a quarter so that it would look good on the outside. So that's all about widths. Next, I wanna talk about grain after I have a drink. So the other advantage of making your own custom binding means you can cut the binding on the grain of your choice. And that means either straight grain, cross grain, or bias grain. So straight grain binding, and we're just going to lay this piece of fabric out um, to kind of demonstrate that. So straight grain bindings are cut on the lengthwise grain. So if this was, this would be the 42 inch width here, I'd have selvages running on each of these sides. So that type of binding has the least amount of stretch. It gives you really great stability, but they're not quite as flexible. So straight grain bindings are really great for quilts because you don't have to worry about wavy edges that might be caused by stretchy bindings. Cross grain bindings are cut this way on the fabric. So on the crosswise grain with the selvages on each side. These have a little more stretch. These are great for straight edges. So they, they make really good use of the fabric and that's the type of binding that we use most often when we're binding straight edges. 
bias bindings are cut on the bias of the fabric, usually at a 45 degree angle to the straight grain. So if you look at this, you can see how stretchy a bias binding would be. And that stretch makes it easier to go around curves and makes it lay nicer. And since your bias binding has a lot more threads along that folded edge, it also extends wear. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of quilters like to use bias binding on the edges of their quilts for binding, because you've got more threads and it's going to last a lot longer. So let's talk next about making bias binding. And we're going to... Um, you know, I think you're going to be surprised how easy it is. Most of the time in Biani patterns, we have you make bias binding using a square of fabric. It's the most efficient way to make cutting layouts and use fabric. Very occasionally, if we only need a few strips, we'll give you diagrams for cutting just the strips you need. But um, the squares give you the most consistency, too, because you're cutting everything with a rotary cutter and ruler. We have um, a free pattern called Easy Does It that has an add-on video that goes into a whole lot of detail about this technique. Uh, so if making bias binding is new to you, we recommend that you watch that. But we're going to talk about the basics today. So the first thing you're going to do is cut a square of fabric to the size that's directed in the pattern. And so we do all the calculations for you. If you want to use this technique for another project, I'll give you some tips on how you calculate the size of square you need it. So in our little Math for Quilters booklet, we have a formula for how much binding you need and how to calculate it. And basically what you're going to do is calculate the number of linear inches of binding that you need. So let's say I want to bind this little peacekeeper bag right here. And it measures 11 inches high and 16 inches wide. So I need to make those measurements all the way around. So if I add 11 twice, 16 twice, I get 54 inches of binding. I usually add another 6 inches or so for each time I need to join the ends. So I'm going to add 6, and that tells me I need 60 linear inches. Then I'm going to multiply that number by the width that you're going to cut those strips. And in this case, we're doing two and a quarter inch binding. So I'm doing 60 inches times two and a quarter inches, which comes to 135 inches. The next step, and for this you want to have a little hand calculator handy, is to find the square root of that number. So the square root of 135 is about 11.6. So I would say you need a minimum of a 12 inch square. However, we always double check to make sure that once we do that, we can get out the full two and a quarter inch strips out of that. In this case, we weren't able to get those, so I would round it up. And we always want to make sure there's room to trim the piece if things get wonky. So in this particular pattern, we rounded that number up to 13 and a half inches. Again, all by any patterns are going to tell you exactly what size square to cut to ensure that you have sufficient binding for your project. So after you've got the square made, let's talk through the price process of what you do next. So once you've cut the proper size of square, you're just going to cut it diagonally from corner to corner. And it doesn't matter if you go this way or this way. Either way, it's going to work out the same. That's going to give me two triangles. So I've got that one there that one there. Then I'm going to rotate those. And I'm going to turn one so that the peak is at the top. I call that a mountain. I'm going to turn the other one so the peak is at the bottom. I call that a value, valley. I put those together to make like a long parallelogram shape. And then I take my valley and fold it over onto my mountain. I let my edges extend by about a quarter of an inch on each side because I'm going to sew this with a quarter inch seam. I sew along that edge, I press that seam open, and I end up with a piece that looks like this. So there's my parallelogram, my pressed seam in the middle, and then from that I'm going to cut my strips. Again, I'm going to be using that with a rotary cutter, so everything's going to be exactly the same thing. The really important thing here is make sure that you're cutting on the bias edge. And when I first started doing this, I always tested to make sure I was using the stretchy edge. If you cut this way, all you end up with is straight grain binding with a whole lot of seams in it. 
and you've defeated your purpose. So um, once you've got those strips cut out, then you're just going to take those and join those together with a little seam right here, bringing those together, press your seams open, and you've got a nice long continuous strip of binding. Again, our video for Easy Does It um, has some great tips for that. It includes the tips for how I made sure that these stripes all matched up and will match up when I join my strips. It also gives some tips on how you cut pieces when you have larger squares. Um, so for instance, if this, this would be okay to put a ruler across, but if it was a great big one, if you fold it in half and then cut your strips, you're going to be able to get them easily. So make sure you check out that video if you need help with that. All right. One more quick drink, and then we're going to talk about attaching bindings. So whether it's cross grain, straight grain, or bias, attaching it is basically the same. And the important thing for that is making sure first that you have the right tools and know a few basic principles. So there are two tools that are essential in my mind to accomplish beautiful bindings. The first one is a quarter inch sewing machine foot because sewing an accurate binding and making sure that it's wrinkle free depends on sewing an accurate quarter inch seam. Glow, can you go down a bit? The other thing that you really want to have, in my opinion, for your machine is the needle down feature. Because if when you're sewing a binding, a lot of times you've got to rearrange things and move them. If you can stop with your needle down so that you know when you start again, you're going to be starting at exactly the same place, that's going to let you readjust things without things moving around. So a good quarter inch foot, needle down, and then a Biani stiletto and pressing tool. I do not think I could sew without this in my hand, and it's especially important for bindings. The thing that I love about our stiletto is it's lightweight. It doesn't feel heavy in my hand. It's um, comfortable to hold. It has flat edges, so when I drop it, it doesn't roll away. But most important is this sand ground point that really helps me position and hold fabric in place. And as we start working through some examples, you'll see how I use that. All right. So the first step, let me grab a few of these and get them organized up here. I miss, I'm missing some of my steps here. Hmm. Well, I'm just going to I did all this yesterday morning, and I seem to be missing one of my steps, but we can make it work with this. So your first step when you're going to bind an edge is to prepare the binding. And when I first started teaching classes, I always took my binding, folded in half, and pressed it. And a lot of times I ended up with wrinkles and creases. So to avoid that, the best option is to take your binding, fold it in half so your long raw edges are together, and pin it. And we're going to pin it every two to three to four inches um, to secure it. So make sure that you're doing that on a flat table um, so that you can really keep those aligned because a crooked binding is going to help cause wrinkles. And we really like to use these little silk pins, extra fine silk pins, because they don't distort the fabric and they make it really easy. After you've got your binding pinned together, then you're going to attach it to your project. And depending on um, what, what you're binding and where you're doing it. Uh, we usually start, uh, we, we like to do it completely by machine, and we found that it's always going to look best on the side that we sewed last. So we generally sew the binding first to the back or the lining side of the piece that we're binding. So I'm going to take my binding, I'm going to align it right along the edge of the piece, and then I'm going to sew it with a nice accurate quarter inch seam. Now, if you're sewing something that's made with mesh or vinyl that doesn't have a right or wrong side, you're just going to have to pick a side. But again, you're just going to sew that with a quarter inch seam, and then you're going to turn it around to the front and enclose the raw edges. If you're doing mesh, and here is an example. 
So if you're doing mesh, again, we've got wrong sides together. We've got our binding aligned with the edge. Our neck, which is here. We've sewn that with our accurate quarter inch seam. Our next step is to fold this over. If you've got a, what you want to do is press that binding up toward the binding. So I go from the back side and I just fold it up and I run my stiletto around along here. I don't want to use an iron because again I don't want to have a sharp crease pressed right there. But by getting all of my seam up towards the binding, then when I go to fold this over and stitch it down, all of my raw edges are hidden inside that binding. I have seen people where they take it and fold it over like this and stitch it down, but then all those raw edges are showing on the other side. So we want to put all the raw edges under there, fold that over, and stitch along the edge, and then we'll have a beautifully finished edge that looks the same on both sides. So that's a really easy way to attach bindings. Believe it or not, we've got another way that's even easier because it takes only one step, and that is binding edges with fold-over elastic. And fold-over elastic is an elastic that has a fold woven right down the middle. Um, it's stretchy, so you can um, use it if you want to gather pockets, but and it comes with two sides. So it's got one side that's a matte finish, one side that's a shiny side. You can use either side out. It just depends which way you fold it. So if you want the, sh the matte side out, you fold it that way. If you want the shiny side out, you fold it that way. When you're ready to attach your binding, you just take the piece that you want to bind, you lay it on, I'm going to do the shiny side up, so you lay it on top of your fold over elastic, aligning it with the edge of the mesh right even with that fold, and then you just fold this over and stitch right along this open edge. And it's just one step. So you take your binding, one step, and you're done. If you cut the binding the same width as the fold over elastic, you get a flat pocket. If you cut your binding shorter than the fold over elastic and you stretch it a little bit as you go, then you get a gathered pocket. And that's what we did on this pocket for the out and about. So we stretched it a little bit so that we've got a pocket here that expands and you can put bulk of your items in it. So that works with fabric or with mesh. And again, when you're binding with fold over, it's just a single stitch. So as you can see, binding a single straight edge is really super easy. But what happens if you want to go all the way around a project um, and it's just not, you know, you have to worry about finishing the ends. So here's some tips for that. I'll get these out of the way. I'm going to have a good mess to clean up when I'm done today. That was a good trick. Glad I had that box right there. So let's talk next about Peacekeeper, and this is a project, there's my little vinyl pocket that I was missing, hiding right in plain sight. So when we are binding projects that go all the way around the project, we really like to use rounded edges. So we round the corners. They look good and they make it really easy to bind. So the first thing that we do when we're getting ready to bind something is round the corners. And for that, we like to use circle rulers. Um, we find that gives us consistent, even results. And we just take a piece that's square, we lay our circle down in the corner, and we cut around the edge using a rotary cutter. So these are the um, templates that we like to use. They're made by Creative Grids. They come in five different sizes, and we've got patterns that use all of them. So after you've got that done, then you can just take your binding and attach it to the edges and go all the way around, easing it as you go around the corners. So the add-on video for this pattern, which is one of our free patterns in our By Any Basics series, it's called Peacekeeper, and it has a whole lot of tips for accomplishing that. So if you haven't downloaded that pattern and watched the video, we really recommend that you do that soon. It's going to have much better camera angles than I can show you today, and it's going to show the actual stitching. But for now, let me just share some tips with you. So again, we're going to sew first to the back of the bag so that when we turn the binding over to the front to finish the edge, we're working from the front. 
If you happen to be someone who prefers to do that final round of stitching by hand, you may prefer to stitch the binding first to the front and then turn it to the back. But either way, doesn't matter which one you're going to do, you want to start where you have the most room for joining the end once the binding is attached. So I usually start on the bottom because it doesn't have the extra handles, I don't have as much to pay attention, and I start in from one of the corners. And I like to leave about a six inch tail so that I have room to work when I join the ends. So I start with my tail about in the middle and I start stitching close to this edge. And as I'm binding, I don't pin or clip the binding to the bag at all. I stretch the binding just a little bit when I sew, and I find it works best to just leave it loose and align it with the edges as I go around the bag. So as I go around, let's, let's say we're getting ready to do this corner. I take my edges of my binding, and I align them so that the edges of the binding are right even aligned with this outside edge. And I just use my fingers to smooth it and ease it as I go around corners. Again, a stiletto is going to be really helpful for that because I can use my stiletto to hold this in place as I maneuver around these other edges. As you sew, you want to make sure that you're sewing a really nice, accurate quarter inch seam. And you want to make sure that your foot is staying parallel to the edge. So as you're sewing here, you want to make sure that this quarter inch foot, that means that the, my needle's a quarter inch away when this edge is even. So I wanna make sure that's going like that. I don't want my foot going like that. I don't want my foot going like that. I want it staying nice and even all the way across this as I go. That's a whole lot to pay attention to while you're also trying to maneuver this and keep your raw edges of your fabric even. So if you have to let something go, let the accurate quarter inch seam go because you can always stitch a little bit narrower and go back and refine the seam later. But you're going to keep stitching, you're going to go all the way around and you're going to stop stitching about right here. Then you will join your ends and finish stitching the binding to the bag. I'm not going to cover how to join the ends in this video because it's a lot of steps. Um, we like to join using a diagonal seam because that um, avoids bulk. And we've got a really good um, section on that in both our Easy Does It video and also in our Beautiful Bindings video. So if you need help with those, be sure and watch those two videos. They're all available on our website and um, they'll, you'll be able to see all the steps for that. So after you get the binding all sewn all the way around, your ends are joined, then your next step is to turn the binding around to the front and stitch along the edge to join that. Before you start stitching, I always recommend that you go all the way around the project and test the binding so that you make sure it's falling out where you want it. And to do that, you just fold it over, maybe put a few clips on to make it sure it's in the right place. And to test it, what you want to look for is that your edge of your binding, there's a line of stitching right here, which was where my binding was attached on the other side. I want this folded edge to fall just beyond that line of stitching so that when I stitch right inside this edge, I'm falling out, hopefully, in the very same line of stitching on the other side. So I don't want to be on this fabric and I don't want to be here. If you find as you turn it around, that the um, fabric goes too far, which is usually the case, that means that your seam allowance wasn't wide enough and you need to go back and refine the seam. If you find that it doesn't reach that seam, that means that your seam allowance was too wide and you can either pick, pick it out and start over or you can trim the seam allowance slightly. That usually happens to me on corners that I see that, oh, that doesn't look like that's going to fit. And so I could take my scissors and trim that a little bit. More often than not, what I end up doing is just using my stiletto to pull it nice and tight. And then I'm able to get it um, to cover that edge without having to trim and it, and it ends up looking great. That's usually my um, preferred way to do that. But again, our goal is that when we're finished stitching, the line of stitching that attached our binding we, we put our folded edge just past that, we stitch just inside that edge, and that line falls out in the same place on the other side. 
And if you look at this, you can see right here, it comes in a little bit closer, but for the most part, it goes the same all the way around the edge. And to me, that's a perfect job. I, I wouldn't worry about that in the least. And doing it by machine makes it so much faster than trying to do it by hand, especially if you've got layers of vinyl and stuff that you're going through. So I highly recommend that if binding's new to you, you work on that, and this is a great project for practicing. If um, you haven't made um, Peacekeeper, um, get the add-on video, get the pattern. It goes through all the steps showing the actual stitching. It gives you some tips if you get any wrinkles in your binding, how to get rid of those, so be sure and watch that. All right, one other way of binding, and it's what we did on these um, project bags. Um, on those, we did rounded corners, and we often do rounded corners because it makes it so easy. But on these bags, uh, we wanted to have every bit of space usable, and we didn't want to round the corners. So um, we decided to do mitered corners. That means we didn't need bias binding, so we just cut our binding on the crosswise grain, and then we um, squared the bindings off, and mitered corners. This is a technique that if you're a quilter is going to be very familiar to you. This is a technique that really helps if you can see it up close and personal, so I'm not going to show you those steps today, but again, if you want to watch our beautiful bindings video, you'll find it in the public videos section of your digital library, you'll find it on our YouTube channel, you'll find it on our tutorials page, and it's going to be a really helpful video to you to learn how to do mitered bindings. All right, so we've talked about binding straight and curved edges on flat pieces, and the good news is that you're going to use those very same techniques to bind the edges on a dimensional bag. So something like this Easy Does It bag, or even the Ultimate Travel bag. So let me put these away, and let's talk about this next. So one thing that's different when you're binding a dimensional bag is that you've got a little bit more layers to go through. And one of the most important tips is that when you're using a, or binding a directional fabric, you've got pieces that have rounded corners. So on Easy Does It, we're rounding the front and the back, and we're joining those with a zipper side strip that forms the top, bottom, and sides of the bag. So that piece has no rounded edges. So whichever piece has the rounded edges is the piece that you want to put you want to put against the bed of the machine first. The piece that has to conform to those curves goes on top. So for easy does it, we're going to put our zip, zipper side strip against our um, back and front. And so the front is against the bed of the machine, the zipper side strip is on top. And you're going to join those pieces together and attach the bindings. Once the binding is attached, you're going to fold it over the raw edges, just like we did on that Peacekeeper bag, and stitch along the folded edge. And again, the add-on video for Easy Does This goes through great detail and shows every step of that, so be sure to watch that or the beautiful bindings video where we had some excerpts if you want to see that. Both of those also show how to join the ends. That's going to give you a bulk free join. Before I go on, I want to talk about an alternate method um, that you can use to attach bindings. And I learned about this method on the Biani Bag Makers Facebook group where it was shared by Kathy Marlowe. Let me dig out some little samples for that. So Kathy's method is very much the same as ours, but she changes the order of stitching a little bit. So rather than sewing the front or the bag, back of the bag to the zipper side strip and then attaching the binding, Kathy's method has you attach the binding first to the zipper side strip. So this is my zipper side strip ready to go for um, my bag front and back. And the first thing that she does is attach the binding to that zipper side strip. So she'll sew that on there, and I find it easiest to lay it in here, sew with my main fabric against the bed of my machine, sew that all the way around, and join my ends. Then she will join this to the bag, and then she's got her binding all ready to go so that she can fold it over and stitch down the edge. 
So my pattern testing team and I have experimented with this method over the past several months to see if it might be more effective in some of our patterns. Each method we found has its pros and cons. So far, we have decided that we like our original method best. But I've seen lots of positive comments from makers in the Facebook group, so I thought I'd share some of the steps with you today in case you want to give it a try. So um, we're just going to use these easy does it step outs. So as you can see, I've attached the binding to each side of the zipper side strip. And in this case, we want our binding on the inside of the bag, so I've attached it to the lining side of the bag. If you wanted the binding on the outside, like on that divide and conquer I showed, then you'd attach it to the other side of the bag. All right, then we're going to, um, then what she's going to do is attach it to the bag just like I said before. Get that out of the way. I can get this out of the way too. Is that better? Yeah. All right. So then, and I pretty much already went through this, all the ex um, explanation of what the steps are. So here are some of the advantages of Kathy's method. First of all, when you attach the binding, um, you're attaching basically it to a straight piece of fabric. So that's going to be easier than attaching it to a curved fabric, even if this is sewn in a loop like this one is. Oh boy, I gotta have a drink. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. It's also going to make it easier when you go to, um, to sew an accurate quarter inch seam, and when you go to join the ends, that's going to be easier. People who've done this also say it makes it easier to see that line of stitching, so when you go to do an accurate quarter inch seam with the next one, you can see that seam easier. With this method, you only have to show, sew on the dimensional parts of the bag twice. So you've, you're sewing this while it's straight, you're sewing that together, and then you're sewing it around. All right, so that's some of the pros to this method. Let's go on now to some of the cons to this method. So when you sew your bag together and you're going around these corners, you've got the binding on top. That makes it more bulky. It makes it less flexible because you've got this binding sewn on here. It also makes it harder to see the corners and maneuver the fabric. So we found that it was not as easy to really smooth out the corners. Also, we really like a tight, fully filled binding. We think that looks best and is least likely to get wrinkly. So we always recommend stretching the binding slightly as we attach it, attach it. And we felt that was easier to do when you put it on after the zipper side strip and bag front or back are sewn together. You've got more control on the tension of the bias binding. You're going around those curves so you know what you need. Um, so it's just easier to do once the bag's been sewn together. It's easier to make some adjustments. If you accidentally get a tuck in the binding or add one while you're joining it, you basically have to take the whole bag apart with um, the other methods, so we like doing it after, um, after we've already got the bag sewn together and we're putting it on top. So we only have to take it off one piece at that time. Also, our method gives you three separate lines of stitching through the bag body and side strip, which we think helps strengthen that seam. The other method has only two lines of stitching through the bag, which is one less line of stitching, so not quite as strong. So while we've decided that we prefer the original method and we plan to continue to write our patterns using that method, um, a lot of people in the Facebook group say that Kathy's method has worked really well for them. So if bindings are something that you struggle with, uh, you might want to give that a try. I still recommend that you keep trying with this method too though, and um, it's really not that hard to master. So we are getting really short on time. I want to be able to take some time for questions. I had planned to talk a little bit about dealing with bulk, talking about how to sew a um, side strip um, for a bag and also using a hammer to hammer edges. But I think we're going to skip those. We talked about um, binding and doing the extra line of stitching to, to reduce bulk and bind the edges of a bag last week. Um, it's also included in our beautiful bindings video. We also talked about using a hammer to hammer seams when you've got lots of um, bulky seams there. So um, watch those videos for those tips and we're going to move on now to um, some questions. Actually, we're going to um, talk just a little bit about a few tips. Go ahead and go down, Glow. 
So the really important things to remember about bindings, there's a few tips. If you want a smooth, wrinkle-free binding, I think the most important thing is make sure you're sewing accurate quarter-inch seams. If your seams are too narrow, your binding's going to be too big and you're going to have wrinkles. If your seams are too wide, you're not going to cover your previous lines of stitching. So accurate quarter-inch seams are essential. Use a stiletto to help position it and make sure that when you fold it over, you're stitching right along that folded edge so that your line of stitching falls out in the same place on the other side. And again, don't forget about our beautiful bindings video as well as our free by any basics patterns, Peacekeeper, Call Me, and Easy Does It. Each one of those has a very in-depth video that has really great tips for attaching bindings, including how to join the ends. And practice and a good attitude help. What I always say is if you think you can, you can. And if you think you can't, you can't. So if you dread bindings and you think they're going to be a problem, you're setting yourself up for problems, in my opinion. If you go at them with the opinion that you can do this and they're no big deal, you're going to find really soon that they're no big deal. So that's, that's my philosophy on bindings. So one question, by, Brooke's got some questions posted here, is can we switch it up and bind on the outside? Yes, as I said earlier, this bag is one I've seen a lot of people do bindings on the outside. So when we sew this together and attach the binding, we put main fabric sides together. If you're going to um, want the binding on the outside, you just put lining sides together and then bind it on the outside. And it's as simple as that to change it around. Next question, can I use a seam ripper instead of a stiletto when binding? Oh my heavens, I definitely don't recommend that. A stiletto has a sharp point, it holds your pieces in place, it's got some roughage on here which helps it and hold, hold it in place. I have, I don't have a seam ripper right here, oh, here's a seam ripper. A seam ripper has a sharp point, but it is so likely that you're going to end up cutting your fabric or tearing your fabric with that, that I don't recommend it. It's also not as easy to hold, it's depending on which one you're using, but I would really be afraid of that. I think you're going to find much, much, much better results using a stiletto. Next question is, when I bind quilts, I sew from the front by machine and hand stitch it to the back. Will this same process work on the bags? Absolutely. If you prefer to do hand stitching, and I know a lot of people do, um, that's a perfectly legitimate way to do it. And in that case, yes, I would sew to the front and then turn it to the back and do the hand stitching down. Uh, Brooke's adding something right here. Scant, scant quarter for binding or an accurate quarter? You want an accurate quarter of an inch seam when you're attaching binding. So if we were making this bag, when we joined, get my little bit of stuffing out of here. So when we sewed the bag together and joined the front and the zipper strip, I would sew those with a scant quarter inch seam. When I attach the binding, I would sew it with an accurate quarter inch seam. The reason I do the scant quarter inch for joining these is that I want to make sure that when I attach my binding with an accurate quarter inch seam, I don't see that other line of stitching. So scant quarter inch seam to join them, accurate quarter inch seam to attach the binding, and then when you fold the binding over, you just want to make sure you're stitching inside that folded edge. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Next question is a fold over elastic question. Do I need to wash the fold over to pre-shrink it like my fabric? We do not wash the fold over to pre-shrink it, but we do take it and um, press it with a low to medium heat on our iron. The thing about fold over elastic is it's elastic. And so when the company who we buy it from winds it on the rolls or puts it in a roll, it stretches a little bit as it goes. And when it comes off of that roll and you lay it down on the table, it starts to relax and it shrinks up a little bit. So rather than let it sit there overnight or till the next day to relax on its own, we just hit it with an iron and get rid of any wrinkles that are in it. And that pre-shrinks it before we start. So by pressing it, we kind of do that thing. It washes really well, but I, th I think the iron works easier for that and doesn't take but a minute. Next question, can you only watch the add-on videos once or multiple times? You can watch the add-on videos over and over and over as many times as you want. There is no limit on how many times 
you can um, watch the add-on videos. So they go in your digital library. You just have to make sure that you are um, logged in so it knows who you are and which add-on videos you have. So you'll log into your account. You'll go to your digital library. All your videos are there, and you can watch them a thousand times if you want, however many times it takes. So especially on those um, by any basics videos, um, watch them as many times as you need until you have the steps mastered. All right, we don't have any announcements today other than just a quick reminder that if you're signing up for the Ultimate Travel Bag, so along on the Biani Face, uh, by any bag makers group. The deadline is this Friday, um, May 13th, so make sure you do that right away. At Biani.com, we want to talk next about our um, local um, quilt shops. We always strongly encourage you to support your local quilt shops. And so before you shop online, please check with your local quilt shop for any of the patterns and supplies that we showed you today. If they don't already have them, they can certainly get them, either from us or from their favorite distributor. We strongly feel that local quilt shops are the lifeblood of our sewing communities and that we all need to do everything we can to keep them strong and in business. So to help support those shops, every year we host a local quilt shop contest during the month of February. And during that contest, we encourage you to vote for your favorite shop and tell us a little bit about makes, what makes them so special. And then to continue the fun and support throughout the year, we highlight stores every week and share some of their voter submissions. So this week we are going to visit two awesome stores uh, because both of them have Biani trunk shows on display and we wanted to let you know about them. So again, I gotta have a quick drink. So the first one we are going to is High Fashion Sewing, who is on the Western Slope of, Grand of Colorado in Grand Junction. And this awesome store has been a family-owned business for over 50 years. Um, for two years in a row, they have been the top voted store in Colorado in our local LQS contest. So they are an authorized dealer for Bernina, Janome, Baby Lock, and Handy Quilter. And they offer a wide variety of technique and project classes, including several biani bag classes and various block of the month programs. So if you go to their website, you can download their current newsletter, which has a quarterly class schedule, and you can also go there to sign up for their weekly email blast. So the store owner, whose name is Jeff Vogel, has his own YouTube channel, which is called Bernina Jeff, and he has over 25,000 subscribers. So their YouTube theme is Keep On Sewing, and his videos feature sewing machine maintenance and repairs that you can do yourself, as well as helpful tools and products. And you don't have to just have a Bernina machine uh, to benefit from his. He's got a lot of great tips that will apply to other machines as well. So be sure to subscribe to their channel so that you know when they post new content. And we will put up a link for you, or you can just search YouTube for Bernina Jeff. So Jerry raved about the people at High Fashion Sewing, and she said, Lorraine is excellent at helping design quilts. Tessa is the baby lock babe. Angie knows all the bells and whistles of Bernina's. Julie is the embroidery queen. And Bernina Jeff has more smarts than a NASA engineer. I loved that. Linda said, the class offerings are endless and the staff is exceptional. There is always something new and someone to help. And Janet shared that visiting high fashion sewing is always special because it's like visiting a good friend. So High Fashion will have a Biani trunk show on display in the store from May 9th to the 14th. And then it's going to move to Palisade, Colorado, where it will be on display at their special retreat that's at the Wine Country Inn from May 16th to 20th. And the theme of that retreat is fall in love with your Bernina again. They've got retreat participants coming from all over the world who are going to be making a custom in control bag and they're going to incorporate several Bernina-specific features, as well as some machine embroidery on both of the outside pockets, which I thought was really cool. So then after the retreat, the trunk show is going to go back to the store, and it will be on display there from May 23rd to the 31st. So if Grand Junction, Colorado is near you, or if you're ready for a fun road trip, be sure to stop in at High Fashion and tell them that Annie sent you. 
Next, we're going to go down to Phoenix, Arizona to visit 35th Avenue Sew and Vac. So they also are a family owned and operated business and they too were started nearly 40 years ago. So originally they were run from a spare room in the owner's home and the company now has three store locations, online sales and an event center. So in addition to their flagship store, which is in Phoenix, they also have stores in El Mirage and Chandler, Arizona. So the Phoenix store is housed in what was once a grocery store, and it's now one of the largest quilt stores in the Southwest with over 20,000 bolts of fabric. Wow, that is a lot. They are an authorized dealer of Baby Lock, Bernina, Handy Quilter, Husqvarna Viking, Juki, and, Glow, well, you gotta go down, Faf, Elna, and they have a large service department as well. So the store has lots of fun events from embroidery workshops to shop hops and two upcoming virtual events that might be of interest to you no matter where you live are Beyond Monograms, which is a free virtual embroidery event that's going to be with Dime on May 27th and also the Great Quilting Adventure Virtual Shop Hop, which is going to be May 23rd to the 28th at 6 p.m. Central each night on Facebook. And that one's going to involve visiting a different store each evening, which I think sounds like a whole lot of fun. So 35th Avenue Sew and Vac is going to have their Biani trunk show on display at the Phoenix store from May 12th to June 18th. So be sure to stop in and check it out. Say hello from everyone at Biani when you go. All right, so thank you again to everyone who joined us today. We are going to be back next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time with a really fun episode of Live with Annie. Uh, we've got special guests joining us for the next three episodes and all of them are going to be sharing tips for quilting your projects. So next week, which is May 18th, we're going to be joined by Linda Brown of Legacy Quilts. Linda does all of our long arm quilting and she's going to be sharing tips for choosing designs and also choosing threads. The following week, which is May 25th, Kate of Knot and Thread Design is going to continue that discussion and she's going to share some tips for working with a long arm quilter and getting the most bang for your quilting buck. And then on June 1st, we're going to be joined by Krista Watson of Krista Quilts, who will share tips for quilting with soft and stable on a domestic machine. So these ladies have so much information to share, so be sure to join us then. And if there are any specific questions you'd like me to ask any of them, be sure to enter them in the comments or send us an email at info at And until then, happy stitching.